Globalization is a really complicated process and it can have a lot of different effects on people in different parts of the world. This lecture will focus on how we can think about these complex experiences for people in the United States. We saw in the previous lecture that global trade had become an increasingly large fraction of countries' economies around the world over the last several decades. And that led to a big economic growth in both the United States and other countries, but it has increasingly been viewed as something that might be detrimental for some people in the United States. And one of the claims about globalization and global trade representing a social problem for American workers is about the outsourcing of manufacturing work in particular from the United States to other countries like China, places in Southeast Asia, um, or Mexico, where workers earn much lower wages than workers do in the United States. And so in order to save money or to make more profits, major companies might move their factories from the United States to these other countries where workers earn less. This was uh, a particular uh, large issue in the 2016 election. Um, and around that time, there were factories, particularly throughout Midwestern states, that were shutting down and moving their operations to Mexico because they said that they just couldn't afford to keep operating in the United States where workers make so much more money than they would have to pay workers in Mexico. Um, one example was a factory that was shutting down in Indianapolis, Indiana, my hometown. Woo. And in that particular example, the company said, we have to move our operations out of the United States into Mexico. We simply can't afford to keep operating here. American workers make too much. And what made it notable was that the, the workers that were told that they were being laid off um, were, went viral on social media and in traditional media um, for their reactions to this announcement. Here's a quick video demonstrating um, what one of these particular factory announcements looks like, but these were actually pretty common occurrences across factories around the United States over the last several decades. So obviously there was a lot of backlash from these workers against the, um, the corporate managers who are making these decisions and announcements. And among the broader claims by the corporate managers, they were saying that um, they simply can't afford to keep operating when American workers might make somewhere around 30 to 50 or $60,000 a year versus in Mexico, the workers at those employee at those factories might be making somewhere around $3 an hour versus $25, $26 an hour for some of the American workers. And so the corporate owners were portraying this as um, just something that they had little control over, that there was this structural factor of workers making different amounts of monies in different countries, and that they simply could not afford um, to keep doing business in the way that they were in the United States. And that's been a recurring theme um, over the last several decades is that uh, as major companies move high profile manufacturing operations out of the United States, um, the claims that they make are about business simply not being possible in the way that they want to do it by manufacturing items in the United States. This came up um, as a, a major issue when um, the United when uh, Apple was manufacturing um, iPhone products and iPhone parts. And um, President Obama at the time was trying to get Steve Jobs, who was um, then the CEO of Apple, to move that manufacturing or keep it in the United States. Um, but instead, Apple um, moved most of its manufacturing to a place that was called Foxconn City in China. It was a massive factory complex um, that housed more than 200,000 workers. They lived and worked at this um, complex and they would work something like 12 hour days. And Steve Jobs was explaining to President Obama, American factories simply can't provide this scale or this ability to adapt to last minute product changes in the way that Apple wanted in order for it to have a successful iPhone manufacturing operation, in its opinion. 
And a notable quote from this meeting was that um, Steve Jobs uh, told President Obama that there's basically not much that the United States could do to bring those jobs back. He said, Mr. President, these jobs are not coming back. Um, and it's a little weird that his name is Steve Jobs and they were talking about jobs. I mean, that's not actually connected to the issue. It's just something that I think is funny, um, but I have like a weird dorky sense of humor. Anyway, um, so the common claim is that there's this structural force that companies are trying to respond to. And that structural force is that it's too expensive and potentially too inflexible to keep manufacturing things in the United States instead of manufacturing them in other countries where they could pay workers less. And that shift of manufacturing work out of the United States has a ton of effects, not just on the people who used to do manufacturing work, but on their communities around them. So this is a short video that demonstrates um, some of the ways that this decline in manufacturing employment spills over and affects other parts of the United States economy and affects inequality in the United States more broadly. It's a little cartoony and it's a little hokey, but it actually does a good job of conveying this information in a really concise way. Apple's iPhone. Sophisticated design. Homegrown. Well, not exactly. The idea starts here, and the new iPhone's processor is made in Texas. But the battery, its display, and most of its other parts are made somewhere else. The iPhone has hundreds of different components, an estimated 90% of which are manufactured with help from workers in Germany, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, China, and elsewhere. Now, outsourcing to China is a story you've heard before, right? You know, China has millions of unskilled workers willing to work for less than Americans. That's not new. But let's take a look at what happens when manufacturing is sent overseas. Take semiconductors, those tiny, essential components of any electronic device. Manufacturing semiconductors happens in three stages. Design, wafer fabrication, and assembly. In the 1960s, U.S. companies started sending low-skill aspects of assembly to Asia. Skilled wafer fabrication followed in the 1980s. And within the last decade, some complex design work has moved overseas as well. The point is that innovation requires relationships between design teams and factory workers. When low-skill jobs go overseas, it creates a vacuum that increasingly pulls higher-wage jobs abroad as well. And losing manufacturing jobs has other consequences, too. As American manufacturing has declined, our economy has lost what's known as a job multiplier. Let's look at some estimates from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. If America were to create 1,000 auto manufacturing jobs, suddenly, auto plants would start ordering more parts from other companies and hiring new managers. Those 1,000 new auto jobs would create other manufacturing jobs, new management jobs, transportation and warehouse jobs, scientific and technical service jobs, as well as various other work. All told, you would add 5,712 total jobs to the economy as a result. Now, consider what happens if you add 1,000 new hospital jobs. More nurses, for instance, means you create other healthcare jobs, like nurse assistants and lab techs. You create other scientific and technical service jobs and various other positions, but only for a total of about 1,700 jobs. This effect shows up in the American economy right now, where Apple is a huge player. Earlier this year, the value of Apple in the stock market made it worth more than the biggest companies in oil, energy, and manufacturing. But Apple only has 43,000 American employees, a fraction of the nearly 400,000 workers that a company like General Motors employed a half century ago. Actually, if you look back at the largest employers in 1960, you had companies like GM and Ford and General Electric, big manufacturers. If you look at the biggest employers now, though, you have Walmart and Target and Kelly Services for temps, big service firms. In other words, the fastest job growth in the American economy today falls into two groups. 
There are companies like Apple and other firms that hire highly skilled workers like software engineers and designers and pay them very high salaries. For a few elite workers, things are pretty good right now. And at the other end of the spectrum, the number of service jobs, like waiters and medical assistants, has also risen significantly. But wages for these jobs, on average, have been stagnant in the last decade. And the jobs in the middle, the work for everyone else, like salespeople and office assistants, steel workers and manufacturers, those jobs have increasingly disappeared. They've been replaced by robots or advances in technology, or they've been sent overseas. That's why our economic problems are so hard to solve right now, say economists. We've become a nation with fewer chances for people to climb into the middle class. So globalization led to a decline in manufacturing employment in the United States that had big effects for American workers, particularly the ones that used to do manufacturing work and can no longer find that kind of employment, but also the way that it spilled over into other local jobs and increased inequality in the United States labor market. Without these middle wage jobs for workers with moderate levels of education, the options that are left for them are limited. Either get more education and get a higher paid professional job, uh, or find less secure, less well paying jobs. And getting higher education has a lot of barriers that come with it for many people. So globalization in some sense has led to a growth of inequality in the United States. Beyond that, let's think more about who has agency in this process. So companies are claiming that they simply can't afford to keep doing business in the way they have and paying American workers as much as they used to. But how much of that is a structural process, meaning that it's about these broader forces of economic change and the um, growth of the availability of labor in one place um, and the differences in costs? And how much of it is about agency? major corporations, people with power to make choices, deciding that one strategy is going to be more viable than the other, or that one outcome, like a corporation's profits, might be more important than another outcome, like employing American workers. We'll watch a brief uh, segment from this uh, documentary that was on PBS. Um, at this point, it seems a little bit like a historical documentary. Uh, it came out in the early 2000s, and it's a program about Walmart. And Walmart is an interesting company uh, to examine for this unit because it's the largest retailer in the world. Um, it employs millions of people at many thousands of stores around the globe. And it, in many ways, embodies this growth of global trade in the 1990s, with products being uh, manufactured in countries like China and then being sold in countries like the United States, but also being sold wherever Walmart is, which is in a lot of places. And what's really interesting about this documentary is that it interviews a number of current and former Walmart executives, as well as other people connected to this um, process of global trade about their particular strategies. Um, it gets them in their own words, des um, describing how is it that Walmart's business model shifted and changed as global trade became increasingly common? And how is it that Walmart's decisions shaped the way this process of global trade unfolded throughout the 1990s and 2000s? So this documentary is really useful for getting a firsthand view of how particular people had agency over the way that global trade became more common and who benefited versus who was harmed by these changing patterns of global trade.
The documentary just showed us how Walmart sets really low prices for cheap goods and for the costs of production in order to maximize its profits. So even with low prices, Walmart is able to maintain its really high profits by making sure that the costs of labor to produce the products it sells stays as low as possible and that the cost of labor for selling these products in the United States stays as low as possible. Beyond this particular documentary, other important ways that powerful companies like Walmart, to be clear, it's not just Walmart, it's a lot of companies that use similar kinds of practices, um, but there's many other ways beyond this process of global trade that Walmart um, can impact patterns of inequality in the United States. One is that Walmart is able to negotiate lower prices for labor in the US by forcing out competitors. Um, in small towns where mom and pop shops used to be the main retailers, a Walmart can come in and undercut the prices of those mom and pop shops, and then it becomes pretty much the only game in town. When it's the only game in town, it has more power to both sell products for whatever price they choose and pay workers whatever wage they choose. Walmart has also been documented as being aggressively um, discouraging toward labor unionization, um, training workers to um, both uh, move away from any kind of efforts to unionize and uh, retaliating against workers that would try to unionize. Labor unions are um, associations of workers that come together uh, to try to boost um, their own bargaining power, boost their wages, their job security, their benefits, um, and by kind of monopolizing the labor in an area, Walmart has the power to push workers away from that. So its major size gives it the power to dictate how global trade might work, the prices for products, the prices for labor. And that's not just unique to Walmart. So when we think about who has agency in this process of global trade, we've got major corporations that are able to dictate how this process works. We've got countries that are able to set policies that either enable or constrain how these corporations do their bargaining and their trading. And then there are workers themselves who have pretty limited agency at all. Um, up against the power of a major corporation like Walmart um, and within the constraints of the laws around global trade that many countries um, mostly enable this kind of free um, economic process between these major corporations, workers often find themselves stuck in the middle. So in the grand scheme of things, when we're thinking about how global trade has impacted workers in the United States, it is complex. There are a lot of different benefits, and costs that many workers experience. On average, workers' wages in the United States are higher with increased global trade. On average, it's about 1,300 bucks more a year. And it is true that as prices go down for basic goods in places like Walmart, but also other stores, people have more purchasing power. So on average, you've got people with a little bit more money and with a good bit more buying power. And so the standard of living in the United States has increased with more global trade. Why people claim it's a problem, it's not been an even experience. There's been a loss of many types of jobs in manufacturing and the kinds of local jobs in communities that depend on major factories and the wages that they use to provide for people. And that's led to a growth of income inequality. So the average person might have some benefits from global trade, but not everyone. Some people are benefiting a lot, others not at all. 